Hello and welcome to the Group Think Podcast. Joining us once again is our friend Sarah Hardjet of uh, How Not to Watch a Motion Picture. I hope I didn't get that wrong again, but yeah, no, that's that, well, that's the um, web address, which is why it's confusing because I call it How to Watch a Movie, but then the web address is How to Watch a Motion Picture. So it's not making it easier for me. I'll <laughs> tell you that much. I, I'm just. Gonna... I should have just had a different title. I know. <laughs> I need to start progressively just making the name more and more incorrect as we go along. <laughs> how to watch a cinema, how to view a film, how to... <laughs> anyway, how's it going? I don't think I've seen you in a better part of a year. Yeah, pretty good. Not too bad. What do you got going? Say again? What do you got going right now? Um, Just a lot of... Uh, theater stuff currently. I, I think I, asked, I, I don't think I've talked to you on the podcast about this, but I, what do you do outside of the film Twitter realm? Because most of the time when I talk to people, it's it's people that tend to uh, tend to either only do film and Twitter, or it's Jacob Airy and he gets paid to do film and Twitter. So yeah, uh, <laughs> outside of, outside of that, I just I'm kind of like participating in a lot of stuff but I don't actually like have a like straight up job like that I'm actually like getting paid for and stuff you know so I do like a lot of uh, theater basically my Twitter as well and stuff like that you kind of cut out a little bit but I, I heard the word theater though yeah that's that's like my my big thing but I don't actually get paid for it so well, nothing wrong with that. It doesn't help. It, it's best to start out with something passionate and then kind of work your way into it. Yeah, I definitely like couldn't stop doing it, so I might as well keep doing it, even though I don't get paid for it. Were you were you a theater kid in high school too? Yeah, I've been doing it for like ten years at least. I, I ran all the AV at my high school's theater. I I only just like maybe a month ago finally got rid of all of the T-shirts that I accumulated over the course of high school. All, like, the, all my pr- the all show my- shirts. Yeah, they, I was just like, you know what? I've got two closets full of clothes, and I can't reasonably ever excuse having a uh, Jupiter Jones Rockstar Vampire Hunter T-shirt ever again. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay. I have Goodwill. Goodwill yeah. gets it. Yeah, I have all those for uh, my swim team from high school, and I just they're just like piles and piles of them. <laughs> I don't. I can't throw them away because I'm like a hoarder. So. Well, I am too. That's a, that's why I was so like harsh with the purging because you can <laughs> you can see they can't see it, but you can see how cluttered my room is at any given point. So, I I as I used to say I keep the crazy on the walls as opposed to in here. So. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. <laughs> well, yeah. Yes and no. I mean, it, it's good to. It's good to have things you like, but it's also good to be sensible and, you know, not own too much stuff. Because at some yeah. point, because at some point you have to move and find homes for all of it. That's when you throw it all away, right? Well, throw it all away, or sell it, or purge it. I think mm-hmm. I, saw, I I took like a whole, like trash bag of old DVDs. I'm never gonna watch again to a used DVD store recently, and I think I got like almost 150 bucks for well, for the whole thing. And they didn't even take all of it, so... Wow. Well, that's what well, that's what happens when you haven't watched... I don't know, what, 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 what... I like, B-movie. Like, the the copy of B-movie I was gifted as a 10-year-old. Like... Nice. Or maybe... I don't think I'll ever watch this copy of Nacho Libre ever again. Maybe I should sell it. <laughs> Nacho Libre? That's a good one. I, I'd have to rewatch it. I, I don't actually remember if I sold that one or not, but because there were a lot of them were like... Should I keep B movie or sell it? Because it's a meme now. So I, I like there were a couple. I was just like, uh, do I, do I need to do I need to keep my copies of Mad- the entire Madagascar trilogy? <laughs> and there were some of uh, it was a it was a hard battle of uh, beating my nostalgia there. Yeah, what that's like. But anyway, how how have things been lately? Then you said you work in you do you're doing the theater. Like, what show are you doing? Uh, we're doing Shrek the Musical. <laughs> Shrek the Musical. It's fun. 
And then I'm in another group that's like uh, Christian oriented. And they're doing a show that the director wrote that's called How Love Wins, which is um, it's basically a story that's written around this uh, Christian music album. I think Natalie Grant wrote it. That was called Music Inspired by the Story. So if you look that up on Spotify, you can find it. And he basically wrote a, a story around it. So it's become a musical with that music as the music, I guess. You know. That's interesting. So it, yeah. I, 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 I haven't heard of that, but that sounds... I, I'd be interested in looking into it. Yeah, I mean, it I, it's like music that's from the perspective of biblical characters. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I mean, my my first thought was they kind of like did like a Mamma Mia thing where they just took a Christian rock band and just wrote a musical around it, but that sounds like a fraught effort. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So it's basically the Bible story, but with like a interesting twist, kind of. Oh, huh. okay. I think he put it on. He was a um, high school theater director a couple of years ago, and he put it on in the, in that high school. And it was pretty good. I saw it, and it was. Hmm. I definitely am enjoying being in it. Okay, I have some friends out in Salt Lake City who are very, very Mormon, and every once in a while, and every couple of years, they do a, uh, like a whole st stage show that they said they wrote and produced themselves. So I, I and and I, I remember when I was out there, I think two years ago, I got to see them perform it. I I will never stop respecting people who put on live performances because it is a nightmare and a half. <laughs> yeah, it's fun though. It's, you get a high off of it. Well, yeah, there's a high involved, and there's also just sheer anxiety and terror. You ha you have to have the right ke like body yeah. chemistry for it. And then and then if the high is worth the terror, then that's why you keep doing it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I was still doing uh, right before my current job about 2017. I was doing, I was the AV guy for a children's theater. And it was a rather fraught job because I had to do basically all of the tech by myself. Well, and, and if anything went wrong, the the director would stomp all the way up to the top of the of the uh, the theater and just be like, "Why is the light cue wrong?" Oh no! <laughs> yeah, so it was one of those situations where the sword of Damocles was just over my head constantly, and and, and I'm kind of glad I ended up getting a new job where it, it made it impossible to do that one because. I like kids, but forcing an entire group of kids into a line, miking them, making them, keeping them all in check for five hours a night is a rather exhausting procedure. I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so what, what's what's the film stuff you've been looking at lately? I mean, I, I, I knew you've been writing a lot more in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I've been trying to catch up on the 2019 movies that I hadn't seen. So, finally got to see 1917 and Little Women. And I think that's about it recently. Well, that's not bad. I mean, there was a, a lot came out in the last few months of this year. It was kind of yeah. annoying. Yeah, it was like 19, 2019 was like a clutch good year. But it came in in the last second and was actually pretty decent. <laughs> I got mad, because for the first, like, ten months of the year, there was, like, maybe five films that was like, okay, this could be on the list. Then I got to November, The Irishman comes out, 4V Ferrari comes out. It just, it, it just a constant string of movies, and I'm sitting here like, why is this year going to be defined by, like, 20 movies that came out at the last possible second? Like I I I almost I almost got mad. Yeah. Like I was like, if Dragged Across Concrete gets washed off this friggin' list, I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. like when that happens because then I'm like oh man this year is so dry I, it was such a bad year for movies by the way here are the 14 movies that couldn't fit on a best of t the 10 best list <laughs> yeah it was it was definitely a weird year I, I saw my favorite movie of the year in 2020 <laughs> kind of unexpected well that's I, 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 I remember getting complaining about that to someone recently how for the past four years, my favorite film out of every single year came out within a month after the year ended, <laughs> which made me, which got, which, when I realized that was happening, I just about blew a gasket, because last year, 
the movie I came to realize was the best movie of the year was Never Look Away, which was from the guy who directed The Lives of Others. Which I don't know if you've seen that or not, but... No, I haven't, no. Lives of Others is on Netflix. It, it's probably the best anti-communist movie ever made. And it's All right. Worth watching. And he had a new movie that came out, and I only heard of it because Kyle Smith over at National Review was talking about it. And so okay, I, I realized it was going to be playing at one theater in Chicago. I went out of my way to see it. There were three people in the audience. I think I was maybe one of 20 people in the United States that actually saw it. Wow. And, and it was the best movie of last year. So I had to retroactively declare it the best movie of this year because it came out in February. <laughs> which is most, right, yeah. Which is mostly just a passive-aggressive jab on my part. But <laughs> And before that, I think the, the, the ones that I called the best of the year were like Phantom Thread and Silence and stuff like that. So, and all, I, I, I'm getting more and more tired of movies that come out in January being the best thing that came out the previous year. Yeah. But yeah, let's... I wish they would come out in the middle of the year, like normal movies. I guess they're all trying to get in the Oscar stuff, though, right? That's why they do that. Well, you know why they do that, right? I mean, it's 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 very specifically because these movies don't know how to market, so they market them specifically as Oscar movies. Right. So the only the only qualification to get in the Oscars is it has to play is a movie has to play for one to two weeks in Los Angeles prior to December of. The year of the Oscars that's happening. Yeah, so, and then once they get the buzz, then they release them wide in January, and then they get an actual audience. There you go. That's what I actually like about the Oscars. That's like the reason why award shows are like worth it. It's not saying it's a bad. Because like nineteen seventeen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because uh, I... <laughs> so Skype is <laughs> glitching out. Sorry. Because, uh, like, 1917 probably wouldn't have gotten near as much money as it would have unless it won the Golden Globe and then was released, you know? So it's like... I mean, I, I know. I, can't like that. I guess, but I think... I mean, obviously, I don't... Wouldn't, I, if I were Sam Mendes, I would not want to open this movie up next to in, uh, Endgame. Like... Yeah, exactly. That that would not be good. So, but I... It, but, if it were me and I controlled the Oscars like an evil man, like I, I would release everything before December thirty first, so that the people who do their lists can have a much easier time. Unfortunately, we don't we don't cater life to those people, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're not the ones who get money out of it. So, well, yeah, exactly. Apparently, the first film to do the whole sell a movie through Oscar buzz thing was The Deer Hunter. When was that? That was late seventies. I forget the exact year. Did you ever see that? No. Uh, it's it's three hours of very boring Vietnam anxiety. So. Oh man, I haven't seen very many movies from the seventies at all. I'm not sure why, but I like I don't like many of them, like Star Wars and Jaws, and that's basically it. Oh, and Alien. Well, that's like it. Seventies <laughs> wasn't really a. That was kind of right at the cusp of the blockbuster decade but yeah it was like a weird decade but the 70s but the 70s was look that was the decade when like all of the the best directors in hollywood got kind of got a free reign to do whatever the heck they wanted for a while so you got all the best scorsese and de palma and trader and Um. uh, spielberg got his start then you got there were a couple good pre-star wars lucas movies I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a lot of, like, really talented people experimenting. I guess it's, like, it's harder to find the good movies from that era, you know? Yeah. And the, and the more I realize, the more, the more I study it and the more I go back, the more I realize that the movies that I think are popular actually aren't. Like, I talked to my dad, who was 10 at the time, and he's like, oh, like, all the popular movies? Like, everyone was watching Tower Inferno and Dirty Harry. I'm like... All right, so it was it was it was all vigilante cop movies and disaster movies. That was what was popular, and then yeah. if you go, and then the, the prestige stuff like the Scorseses of the world, they were there. They were making an immense amount of money and success, but they weren't the popular things, I guess. So yeah, that no one knew that they were going to be what they're basically. That's what the future was, and no one noticed yet. Well. Yes and no. I mean, I, I wouldn't say Scorsese was the future so much as I would say Spielberg was the future, because he's kind of the one that turned Hollywood yeah. into blockbuster mania, which we've yet to find a way to escape from. 
<laughs> I'm sure he didn't intend it to be like this. <laughs> oh no, I, I, I don't. I, there are like interviews where you can find George Lucas lamenting the fact that Star Wars basically killed Hollywood. So yeah, it's too bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Well. well, it's not like the movies don't get made anymore. It's just Scorsese has to go to Netflix to get an Irishman made. Yeah. So, uh, tell us what, what were some of your thoughts on 1917, then, because you've been kind of the biggest proponent of this film I've seen online. Yeah, kind of turned myself into a fangirl of it. <laughs> well, I mean, I knew that it was going to be my favorite movie of the year, so uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm still overwhelmed by it. I saw it twice now, and I just want to go back and see it again. <laughs> it was so nice. It was so beautiful. And I was like so scared that the um, that the gimmick thing was going to be just a gimmick, and I because I like hate like unpopular opinion, but I really didn't like Children of Men, and I thought that Same, the long actually. Take... <laughs> oh good the 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 long takes in that just bothered me so much that they were <sighs> they like they like distracted me from the story, and then. I never actually like cared about the characters in that movie at all, so I thought that 1917, like if they did it wrong, was going to end up being like that, and I was kind of scared about that. But like the the continuous take, like really just it was like watching a play, kind of where, and I really like that how you get to like look at what you want to see in a play. It's like you know, you can watch this character over here who's not doing anything or this little detail over here or something. And that is the impression that I got watching 1917. Like, I could look at the little details. And I know that the movie actually wanted me to see those little details, but I felt like I was discovering them. So I felt like I was, like, getting to know, like, a real person by watching them. So I felt really connected with the characters. And... It just worked perfectly on me. Well, that's good. Do you like Sam? Uh, are you a Sam Mendes fan in general, or have you seen his other movies? Not really. I, I thought that Skyfall was really nice and pretty. I don't remember watching Spectre, but I think I did. And I don't think I've seen any of his other movies. Spectre's bad. I don't. I I've seen it. I saw it once in the theater, but I don't recall anything about it. Other than yeah, other it's than... very unmemorable. Yeah, but Skyfall was pretty, but I didn't really care about the story. I'm not a big James Bond fan, so, but, yeah, so I, I'm definitely a Sam Mendes fan now, <laughs> but not really before. At some point, I need to go back and watch all of his early 2000s movies, because he did American Beauty and Jarhead back around the turn of the millennium, Yeah, and I, I've seen Road to Perdition, which I think is the only one. Oh, his... yeah, I love that movie. That was a good movie. I forgot that that was Sam Mendes, but I always forget about that. Yeah, he kind of walks this weird line where he's, like, insanely pretentious as an auteur, but then he turns around and makes, like, pretty above-average, like, prestige fare that people tend to really like. Mm -hmm. Like, prestige and Skyfall and now this. So he's not super, he's not so pretentious that people don't like him. Yeah. But he is pretty dang nice ambitious. Yeah. And I like, I like, I kept watching, like, interviews and stuff, and I love that he's just, like so focused on like story and character and so he doesn't like d he, do he has a lot of like artistic uh, like endeavors and things that he wants to do and stuff but he's always like putting the story first and trying to make the artists the artistic part like serve the story and the characters instead of the other way around and that's what i like because i'm a story person uh, did you read my review on it on 1917 yeah yeah and I want to know um, what what you thought the the theme was, or something. You said that the theme didn't like line up in the end, or something. I had mixed. I, mean, I I'll say I liked the movie a lot. I threw it on my best year movies of the year list because I think it <laughs> deserved it. I, I just thought the movie was a little, either somewhat muddled in its themes or had the opportunity to say something much darker and didn't take it. Oh yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Like, what did you, what do you think the darker direction should have been? Like, that was what I was curious to know. Like, I kind of like it's a World War One movie. Like, I think that I hate to say it, but I think the final scene should have been seeing just how bad World War One should have gotten because 
if the, if we're making a movie about the horror of war and about the needlessness of conflict and the needlessness of bravado in the face of destruction, you, it would kind of be incumbent on the film to show that. Like, the whole movie is about they stop this entire battalion from running into battle based on the, the whims of an overambitious general. Does that mean that we should... I mean, I, obviously, the as a action movie, you don't want to see that to happen. You don't. You want them to succeed and stop the, the carnage from happening. But it's a war movie, and I think part of being in a war movie is realizing that there are days when bad people send their men out into the middle of nowhere and no one comes back. I mean, that was just a reality of the war, so like World War One. So you think that? So you think at the end of the movie, Benedict Cumberbatch should have just ignored the orders and sent them out anyway? And in, in if if that was if that's the theme they wanted to say ultimately with the film, then yeah, like if that if is it depends on what your goal with the movie is. Are you trying to do an action movie set in World War One? Are you trying to do a an an anti war movie? Because I, I don't think it was an anti war movie. Do you think that's what he was trying to do? I, I I don't think that there are many war movies that aren't ultimately anti war movies. I mean, well, it's it's not like you. I mean. It's definitely showing the horror of war, but it's not like saying that the war was unnecessary. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. What is your historical knowledge on the First World War? Not very much, admittedly. I mean, the World War One is essentially the most pointless war we've had in the past century and a half. There was no greater purpose to its fighting. It, it was just different nations kind of allying themselves, sending people off into the. Uh, into the ether, and then eventually just recalling the troops at the end when they all agreed to stop fighting. It was, there wasn't really even that much, like, movement of the lines all that much. The pe People yeah. would dig in for years at a time, and the lines would basically stay where they were. So it wasn't a situation where you would send troops off to, uh, to invade Belgium and succeed. It was a situation where people would climb out of the line, run in mass, and mostly not succeed at getting anywhere. Yeah, so by that, then, like, any World War I movie is essentially, by nature, an anti-war movie because the war was like that, you know? It's not like 1917 went out of its way to be like, oh, war is bad. It went out of its way to show an individual soldier's struggle through a, a war that's like that. And to, to like... Because, um... When Sam Mendes was talking about um, his grandfather's like involvement in it and um, how he would tell stories to it to him when he was a kid, he, it was always about like how he survived basically on chance, you know. And like this thing happened, and if this hadn't happened, and this hadn't happened, and this hadn't happened, that wouldn't have happened. But it did happen. And it's like just a war of like he made it through out of coincidence. And that's what I thought the theme was like, that Schofield is not even the hero of the story, really. And because he went to get the water instead of Blake, Blake was killed. And then he had to keep going, even though it wasn't even really his story. And somehow, because of all these coincidences that happened, he ended up doing the thing and surviving. I thought the scene where Taron Edgerton died was actually probably the most like striking moment of the movie. Taron like, Edgerton. Uh, what's I for, the actor who plays uh, Eggsy and Kingsman? He wasn't in that movie. He he was the he was one of the two soldiers. No, that was Dean Charles Chapman. That wasn't Taron Edgerton. No. I mean, I'm gonna. He does look like him. <laughs> I'm gonna need to research this later because I was 99% certain that was Taron Edgerton. Yeah, it's Dean Charles Chapman and George McKay. Okay, I'm, I'm a, this is gonna become a problem later, but I mean, it was that the guy who died, like uh -huh. I thought that was a pretty striking moment in and of itself. Just as watching, yeah, and, and it, it proves the point as to what the movie is ultimately about. Like, this isn't a story about two people that are going to triumphantly walk into the sunset. It's a story about two people scraping by over the course of a day just to just to barely succeed and, yeah. I, and, I, and i think that it kind of comes into focus when you see the dedication because then it becomes kind of clear that oh this is a movie about that this is a, this is the director kind of sending a writing a, a love letter to his grandfather 
and mm-hmm. honoring someone who he knew served in a point in a kind of incredibly fraught conflict. And I think that's that's really touching. I think that's it's ultimately trying to him trying to capture just this one little seed of uh, bravery and gent- and hope in the sense in all of the chaos of World War One. Yeah, that's what I liked about it. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I, I'm just. I'm sitting here comparing this to something like All Quiet on the Western Front or Paths of Glory, where those movies are very, very focused on what World War One was as a conflict, and I and I'm, yeah. I I just don't think it quite gets to the height of those films. But... Yeah, that's because it's different, right? It's more about an individual than about the whole thing, the thing, the war as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean it's like the, it's the difference between something like Saving Private Ryan and Fury, if you ever saw that. I didn't see Fury. Oh my gosh, Fury! Yeah, that's that, that's like it's like the most grindhousey World War II movie ever, but it is amazing. It's also I think, also I think it's the last good thing that the director that the director of Suicide Squad ever did. So, <laughs> did he do anything good before that? Training Day, a handful of other things. He did Training Day. I think he, he either wrote it or directed it. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, he also did Ed, End of Watch. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. It's pretty good. It's just it's just a police drama. So, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it it really just depends on what you're trying to ask from 1917 that determines how much you want for that, like how much it delivers. I mean, yeah. I mean, my and and my review, I didn't say it was bad or anything. So obviously, so I mean, my my ultimate point was just kind of a question as to what its intentions are and what it's trying to say versus what it could have said with the setup it had. I don't think it was trying to say anything particular you know like the best movies are movies that like have a lot to them and then you can take what you want out of them well that's fair i mean i i would say i mean it's the kind of movie that really only works as a movie like because it's because it's really just about two uh, the camera following these two people on a singular journey like that wouldn't i i, I thought of like is this a guy is this the kind of thing that would work as like a book or is this? Is that, I wouldn't say really because this is kind of a the kind of story you can really only tell with film. Yeah, yeah, that's a great thing about it too. Like it wouldn't even work on stage, even though it is kind of like a play because yeah, I, it it's so takes so so much space. I was gonna say a stage play version of this would be interesting, but it would just be two people like randomly walking you through a theater, walking across the stage, go out the wings, come in the other side, go out the other side, come in the other side. <laughs> Oh, that would be ridiculous. <laughs> there's there's some great potential there for a kind a version of that story is that in a theater, but that would be so fraught. <laughs> yeah, it just totally. would, it would have to have a completely different like set piece, uh, completely different set pieces and setups. Yeah, but I have to be cool. Like, did you ever see like the the play version of Les Misérables? Say again. Did you ever, did you ever see the Broadway version of Les Misérables? No, I didn't. I remember I saw it back in high school, and the way they had it set up was that they had these massive stages that would just kind of glide in and out, and it would, they, and they had like t- a dozen different sets that would just kind of automatically glide in and off the stage, and like, I could see them doing something like that set in World War One, where it's just two people walking randomly around, and then the set cha- on the, the on the stage changes randomly. That could be interesting. Yeah, or have one of those stages that rotates the circles. Oh man. Others. They they can just walk in the in front at the speed that the, it's rotating, so they're just always in the center of the stage. <laughs> oh man, that's that would be a challenge. <laughs> Not that it couldn't happen now, man. We have the we have the miracle of cats behind us, so obviously anything can be done in theater. <laughs> oh gosh. Which I will say, I have yet to see cats, and I do not regret not seeing cats. So, have you seen like the? People I thought on... I would see cats just to laugh at it. It seems like a fever oh, dream, though. Sorry. Like it doesn't sound fun or comfortable, and and it doesn't yeah. help. It doesn't help that the actual like fan base for cats on Twitter is just really freaking creepy. Like, have you seen those? There's people? a fan base for cats. No, I haven't seen anyone that liked it. Yeah, it's it's like I, I've seen a lot of like, I guess I would call them like borderline nihilist, like progressive film critics, like Patrick Williams and Film Crit Hulk, and people like that who 
are kind of more aware of the stage play for what it was, who went and saw it, and they're like, mm. oh, man, it's this weird, silly fever dream. I loved it. I want to go see it, like, three more times. And I'm sitting here like, is this, like, an an exercise in the meaninglessness of life or something? Because I, 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 I don't get the appeal. Like, I have one friend who went and hate-watched it, and then that was it. Yeah. I was thinking I would hate watch it because me and my brothers love doing that, but I don't want to watch the scene with the cockroaches. That, I don't that either. Me out. I really don't like, that's either. That's genuinely a like no go for me. Like I do not want to see that. I saw like a, a the video on YouTube, and I was like, no, I can't look at that. It's just mm. it's it's so wrong. I, I'm. I, I'm I'm at a loss for words about it. I'm just glad I didn't see it. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Good thing I found out about the cockroaches before I watched it. <laughs> oh, man. I think the funny thing was I think that opened up against Star Wars, so that was technically counter-programming. <laughs> Although I don't know who that was counter-programming for. Oh, it also came out the same day as Bombshell, the, the Megyn Kelly movie that no one saw. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Which I heard it about. <laughs> which, which I almost hate watch that one. Because that uh, would that would have been funny. That would have just annoyed me probably. I mean, it's it's what it is. So you you, you said the other movie you saw was Little Women? Yes. I got to see Little Women. I, I saw you were going back and forth with society reviews on that. What Was he saying that it's like f a feminist propaganda or something? Oh, or? yeah. He said that based on the trailer. And we had that discussion a couple months ago. And I was like, I don't think it's going to be a feminist movie. Because I can see how they're like putting feminist talking points in the trailer. But knowing the story, I'm pretty sure that it's mystical. The story itself is not a feminist story. Like, not any, it's definitely not third wave feminist, anyway. I guess, like, first wave, you could call it that. But, so we were, he was like, you know, it's definitely feminist. And I'm like, I don't think so. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, I actually forgot that I was worried that it was going to be feminist. And then I was like, oh, I remember talking with Jacob about that. I'm going to go tell him that it's not feminist. Because <laughs> it's not. It was definitely not feminist. Have you like, read the part, um, go ahead. I was going to say, had you read the book, but you can finish that thought. No, I haven't actually read the book yet. I think I will now. I want. I kind of want to see, because um, I really liked the way it was structured. So I kind of want to see how the story originally, that I can understand why better she decided to structure it the way she did, you know? Yeah, I mean, same for me. But, I, um, I tried to read the book before it came out, and I just couldn't, I, I didn't have enough time to do it. And from what I can tell for the book version is that it's pl written could be just completely it, it's, it's chronological unlike the film, and yeah. I'm and I'm pretty, yeah like the Winona and Ryder version. And I'm pretty sure all of the scenes where uh, Cersei Ronan is the as the publisher as the author of the book, I'm pretty sure that's apocryphal to the actual text too because that's just kind of just a reframing device to kind of recontextualize some of the story because a. I, apparently, the story is to some degree based off of the the author's real life to some degree, and so it's all just fictionalized names right. and stuff like that. So that's what that was alluding to. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's structured in in a way to just kind of make it so that every point just kind of bounces off another point in the no in the story, which is confusing the first time you watch it, but it works yeah. really well. Yeah, I can see how it'd be confusing, especially if you don't know the story already. Like, like I thought that it was uh, understandable enough just because one timeline was blue and one timeline was yellow. So you can kind of tell visually when it switches. But there was, I was like in the bathroom after the show and the, some old ladies were like, I couldn't tell when it was future or when it was past. <laughs> so, oh well. <laughs> Doesn't look on everyone, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, once you kind of realize that it's doing it, you can follow a little bit better, because, like, okay, this is when they're younger, this is when they're older, this is when X is happening, yeah. this is when Y is happening, but it takes a while to kind of 
figure out that pace. I'll, I'll, but, yeah. Although there were a couple jabs in the film, I, I wrote, I, I, sub, uh, I gave, uh, I had a review for it published at, Chris, at Christian Toto's of site, and mm-hmm. I pointed out that there are a couple moments in the film that feel like they're kind of uh, uh, dog whistling to feminists. Like there's that really weird moment where Laura Derns with the uh, the woman at the nursing station, and she and she's like, "Man, I've never been proud of my country before." And then the and then the black nurse turns to her and she's like, "You still shouldn't be." And I'm like, "Yeah, you're that was hilarious." Your husband is fighting the civil war. Why are you yeah, not I'm proud? Yeah, I'm sure of... people back then were proud of their country. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I mean, I do, I've I'm aware that the concept of the expatriate isn't new. But why are we ta- Why are the the wives all like really cynical about what it, about living in America? And I'm like, especially when you're in the middle of a war that you don't know the outcome of, and you don't know if your husband's alive. I mean, I mean yeah, it, it's just a little stupid line. It, I, I might, it might, it might be in the original book. I don't know, but uh, I doubt it. It seemed very much like a little throw-in, kind of like anti-America, kind of almost. I guess not anti-American, more, uh, yeah, like, uh, America is racist, so we should be ashamed of that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Little chat. I mean, so it, like, I guess I would, I would say something like that is the most feminist line of the whole movie, but... Yeah. But yeah. then, like, in the trailer, they, like, have a lot of, like, feminist-seeming lines. You know, like, when Joe is ranting about how she's so tired of being told that love is all women are good for, and, you know, it comes across so feminist in the trailer, but then in the movie, at the end of that, she's like, but I'm so lonely, like, you realize, watching the movie, that, yeah, of course, but, like, love is a good thing, guys, and she was, like, uh, hurting herself by denying that for her, you know? Well, so then it completely ruins the, like, feminist power of it. I think it's completely fair to say this was marketed towards that, that the kind of coalition yeah. of, like, inner city, strong, independent women and, and mm-hmm. who don't need no man. I, I yeah. think that's who it's sold to, but when it comes down to... Still, the, still, the message is not that. No, I mean... Uh, the most the most feminist and feminist thing about the movie is that Emma Watson has a role in the film. Like, <laughs> which, True story. Yeah, I mean, I I remember I put I said in my review is like the most feminist thing about it is the fact that Laura Dern and Emma Watson are here, and I, I mean Laura Dern is probably like the most I can't think of an actress who kind of embodies fem like aggressive feminism in every single role that she's ever been in more than her. I mean, you you see it back in Jurassic Park. Yeah, there's like mm-hmm. there's like one one dumb throwaway feminist line in like ni- a movie from 1991. So, and then of course she's what's her name in Last Jedi. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but beyond that, I don't. I think the concerns are kind of misstated. Did yeah. did you, did you see uh, Gerwig's previous film? Uh, Lady Bird. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about that in comparison? Uh, I liked it a lot, actually. I was surprised how much I liked it. Um, I'm not sure how I could co- compare them. I thought that Lady Bird is more uh, personal, I guess. Like, a, an original story. and But they, they did seem very similar. Like, definitely Greta Gerwig has that kind of style where... Um, I guess it's kind of like a lightness to her that I really like. I'm try- I mean, I I was trying to remember my thoughts on it at the time. Where I mean, I like Lady Bird a lot. My my only real problem with it was that I've is that I've met people like the main character in that movie in real life, and they're not weird, quirky people. If you know what I mean, like they're they're the kind of people that burn down their their friendships on a whim. And cause a massive amounts of drama in the lives of everyone around them. But beyond, mm-hmm. but beyond that, it's a, it's a great movie. I remember I, I I was I hosted a talk show about it, and one of the guests sat there and talked about how much the movie meant to her because it was because she related to having a complicated relationship with their mother. And I think that movie does that does a really good job capturing that. 
Yeah, yeah, I really like that part. But yeah, I'm curious what Gerwig's gonna do now, because now she's like... The now big... she's gotta go get that uh, directing nomination, since she missed out on it this year. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I wonder if that's what the, the big plot twist of the Oscars this year is gonna be. Because I, I see this going in like two directions. One is that Joker wins everything, and my desire to watch the world burn is satiated. <laughs> and alternatively, they go with the most progressive option possible because everyone's still mad at them that Green Book won last year, and they go with late Little Women because I think that's the only one of the movies that I would call like progressive in any sort of way. Hmm. I'd have to pull up the list because, but there didn't look like there was anything. This this wasn't that political of a year. I know it was so nice. <laughs> I actually like like last year the only best picture nominated movie that I saw was Black Panther and that was just because I went to see every Marvel movie. The rest of them were like just like boring Oscar grab movies. And this year I actually saw six of them just because I wanted to, not because they were nominated. Yeah. Well, it wasn't just a moonlight situation where they gave the movie well actually I haven't seen Moonlight, so I can't speak if it deserved it or not, but it doesn't feel like they just gave it to a movie because it was woke, but... Yeah, yeah. I'm really curious as to what the what the logical pick is this year, because they all kind of seem like they deserve it in a weird way. Yeah. I feel like I want to say that the logical pick is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but then that one hasn't been actually winning that much, so it seems like it's not. That's, that's what I think is the objective, probably, best. Well... But I kind of want 1917 to win it. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. I mean, that, that from a technical standpoint, I could definitely see that winning a lot. But I, I'm always... It's really hard to kind of nail down what the actual Oscars taste is. Except, yeah. except beyond... My general pick is generally the most bland and or most self-aggrandizing of the lot is probably the one that's going to win. <laughs> so You just have a really bad opinion of the Oscars, right? I have an absolutely abysmal opinion of the Oscars. <laughs> I, I if it weren't if it weren't for the fact that everyone else cared, I would not care myself. But yeah. I, I, I the only reason it matters to me because obviously it has a lot, it, it tends to people who get Os the Oscars affects people's careers. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's it means something to the people that win it. But it, beyond that, it doesn't really have any cultural impact on what people go to see, or what matters, or what actually is the best movie of that year. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's not like Avengers Endgame or is gonna w is gonna win Best Picture. Yet that movie is the most six financially successful film of all time. So now I'm I'm actually I'm actually curious. Now I'm gonna pull up the list just so I can answer my own question. And my computer is slow as molasses. <laughs> all right. Oscar nominations for the 92nd. It Jojo Rabbit is on there. That's weird. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I love that movie, but it's like it feels it's the least Oscar nominated feeling film of the lot. Yeah, that's because this year the the Oscar nominated movies don't actually feel like Oscar movies for some reason. I mean, I kind of had the They're same like thought. Actual movies. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, mean, I kind of had the same thought to a degree last year, but last year there wasn't really an obvious like best picture winner. So when they were like, "What are the best pictures?" Uh, 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 Black Panther and Black Klansman. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Black Panther. Okay, I get the cultural significance, but Black Klansman is only good insofar as if you've seen the rest of Spike Lee's movies and you realize how bad the rest of most of Spike Lee's <laughs> movies are. But everyone's just like, oh, he made a pretty good movie in comparison to Chirac. Give him an Oscar. Have him go on stage so he can say bad things about the president. I'm like, <laughs> that's that sounds about right, but it wasn't an interesting pick. I mean, I, 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 I know so many people that are like, man, that Black Klansman... I mean, I don't want to rant about this, whatever, but... But yeah, I mean, if I'm being honest... I'd say the pick's probably Joker, and I'm not just saying that because I want it to be the case, even though I think the movie is middling, but 
I, I think that if I'm looking at this and being like, what actually appeals to the Oscar sensibilities, it's either the Irishman or Joker, because the Irishman is, has the Scorsese factor, and I think a lot of people are going to want to jump on that, especially like the older boomer, like Oscar people, because most of them are just like people that grew up in the 50s and 60s, so they all have an emotional connection to Scorsese. But I'm looking at this like everything is so even. Like, what's going to happen is that the is that it's going to turn into a popularity contest. And the one that is, and one of them is going to slightly edge out the other ones, and I think that the best chance is probably Joker in that situation. That would be pretty hilarious. I know it I, would be I would great. I would of that. I actually wouldn't mind any of them winning, which is interesting. I would just be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you have you seen the reaction like people are having to the idea that Joker was nominated? Yeah, well, you know, they're determined to hate it. Yeah, I mean, it's people... to hate it when it came out. Exactly. And now people are going to be like, oh man, the first Oscar winning superhero movie ever is Joker, as opposed to Black Panther. The, unbe <laughs> the unbelievable whiteness of the Oscars. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty funny. Oh man, I, I mean, it's thematically appropriate too, because sometimes it's just fun to watch the world burn. But. Yeah. And those are the people. The people who would be mad about that are the people who feel justified in their movie opinions by the Oscars, which is just so funny because, like, we don't care. Like, we have our movie opinions. The Oscars can do what they want. It doesn't influence us. But then people who are like, "Yes, my picture is the Oscar. And now I have good opinions." So then they're going to be like, "Oh no, what am I doing? The, the Oscars are letting me down." <laughs> well, crap. Now I need to actually go to an Oscars party and dress up as the Joker. <laughs> Now, I mean, like, all the movie theaters around me, like, ha come and see the Oscars live! And I'm like, well, crap, do I actually have to do this now? Do I need to really commit to the joke this much? Oh, they do that? They show the Oscars in movie theaters? Uh, not, like, major ones, but, like, independently owned movie theaters that are smaller around here do it. Wow. I mean, I don't know if that's cool or not. It's the Oscars, so. I like watching it at home. So I can go get the kitchen and get snacks while the commercials are on. I don't live tweet it with my friend. Or not live tweet, live text it. Do you have cable? Like, oh, that that was so stupid, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't even have cable anymore, so I don't know if I'll be able to watch it. Oh. What channel is it on? Uh, I don't know. Is it NBC? If it's like one of the, the core channels, then maybe. Because hmm. I still get over the air. I mean, we have two of those tiny, like, Best Buy and television antennas, and occasionally they pick up television, but it's it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a bet as to whether or not they will on any given day, but... Mm. Yeah, so I guess I'm gonna have to go to, to a local movie theater dressed as the Joker now to... to, to <laughs> <laughs> or just not even bother, because why? <laughs> well, I have to contribute to the world burning. I mean... <laughs> Whatever the coronavirus doesn't kill, I have to help in the in the aftermath, so. <laughs> Did you see Joker? Yeah. One of the ten, one of the ten movies you saw. Uh, but, I mean, what, what did you think about it, actually? Like honestly. I really liked it. Like, I was actually, like, nervous going in, not because I was afraid that my theater was going to get shut up, but because <laughs> I don't really enjoy serious, dark, like depressing movies and i thought if it's a villain origin story for the joker there's no way that i'm going to get anything positive out of it you know but i did and even though it was a serious and depressing and dark depressing movie that ended badly like i actually like like left the theater feeling better about the world than i did going in kind of you know that's fair that was very interesting I had a slightly more middling reaction to it than a lot of people did, because I've seen so many people that are, like, on the opposite extremes of Joker. Like, uh, the guy who hosts the YouTube channel Armored Skeptic did a video where he declared it the best movie since The Empire Strikes Back, which <laughs> I thought was a bit extreme. <laughs> yeah. And then on the alternative, you get the people that are like, this movie is justifying white male rage, it's gonna get everyone killed... Yeah. Like, I mean, okay. It's just a movie, guys. 
It's just it, a movie. It, to me, it's a movie that's about capturing the the sense of a very particular moment. Yeah, like, and that and that it was really good at that. And maybe it won't last in a few years, and it won't be relevant anymore. But for the moment that it was in, it was really powerful. Yeah, I mean, I I would not be surprised if I watched it in ten years and I was like, this movie is aged horribly. Yeah, like but it, that's not what it was meant to do, so it's fine. Yeah, if if ten years from now the internet's gone away and we're all living lives of joy and contentment, maybe it, <laughs> this movie will seem like complete a complete anachronism, like one of those weird mo- political movies from the nineteen eighties. Like, yeah. oh, this is this is awkward. This is dated horribly. Yeah. Yeah, I would be okay with that. I mean, movies are made for a moment, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Did what did you? Uh, trying to think of what else. We last time we talked, you said that the your favorite movies of the year thus far were Once Upon a Time and Ad Astra. Has, yes. Has uh, ni- have the movies you've seen since then kind of changed that to you or? Uh, nineteen seventeen's at the top now. Oh wow! But that's. Wow. That's just personal. Like, I don't... It, I have to see it, like... I've seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like, five or six times now. And I've only seen 1917 twice. So I can't really judge whether... Which one will actually be better. Because 1917 is newer to me. So I feel... I feel a lot more... Um, loving towards it right now. But... I feel like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood might last longer... You know, once I get tired of both of them, I might come back to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood more. But I'm not sure. We'll have to wait and see. I mean, that's so fair. that's kind of it's kind of like a tie between them because they're so different. It's kind of hard to judge between them. Yeah, I, I mean, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood it feels like the kind of movie that's gonna have a lot of staying power to it. Yeah. Although it's weird that there's been a. Have you noticed that there's said some critics have kind of turned against it? No, I haven't. I, I maybe maybe it's just some of the ones I'm following, but I found a couple of film critics who have basically like completely thrown it out and decided they don't they like it's not one of the better movies they've seen this year, and I'm just sitting here like, did we watch the same movie? Like, <laughs> this movie is yeah. so this movie is so textured and interesting. Like, people are going to be talking about it in a decade. Yeah, I don't know. Some people just want to be contrary. I guess. I guess. I mean, I, I, it, it's weird to me when people. Get it, get that reactionary to the point where they're like, "This movie sucks because things around the movie suck." So, yeah, yeah, yeah. They it, can't actually like judge it as art; they just have to judge it as like how they feel around it. Did you see The Irishman? Yes, I did. What did you think about that? That's another movie that's kind of having that same reaction with some people. Yeah, I really was surprised at how interesting it was. Like. We sat down and watched it in one night. I think we paused it twice for <laughs> breaks. And I, I, like, watched it with my brothers, and they'll get, like, talkative if a movie is boring, you know? But we were, like, quiet the whole time, just, like, paying attention to the scenes, and it was really engaging. But I don't think that it's going to last very long because the CGI de-aging is not really up to par. Like... It's as good as it could have been, and it's necessary for the style of the story because it takes place over so many years. But I don't think that it's um, as as good as it should be in order for the movie to actually like last. Because five years from now, you're going to look at it and be like, "Oh, that's really obvious," and then it's going to take you out of the movie and it's going to bother you, you know. I mean, so that's kind of like a detriment to it. But otherwise, the story of, and everything about it was just really good. I mean, I saw it in a movie theater in the third row, so the CGI didn't necessarily bother me all that much. Because I was just staring into an ocean of blue and giant faces. So, right. So maybe I, maybe if when I watch it, when I finally do sit down and watch it again, it's going to have a different reaction for me. But I don't know. Like, it felt... It, it felt a lot more important and grand than I thought it would. And mm. I'm surprised that it's gotten some negative reactions from people. Like, I know I, Bridget Fetessy was talking on Twitter a couple of weeks ago saying, like, anyone who... The, this, the Irishman is bad and shouldn't even be considered a movie. And I'm just... Like, <laughs> no, no, it's... This, this feels like a culmination of something. Like, it feels like the guy who made Goodfellas remaking Goodfellas with the anxiety that 
his entire life may have been wasted. And I'm like, yeah, that's so it, that's such an interesting idea. Like the last hour of the Irishman is, I wouldn't say it's like the best stuff Scorsese's done, but it's some of the most interesting stuff he's done in decades. Yeah, it really makes you think, and it feels very like from its it's from a very uh, re- personal perspective. Yeah, I mean, and Scorsese has always had this weird thing where he's one foot in and one foot out of his Catholic faith. And, and you yeah. you really sense it in this movie, where he's just like, this character has lived his entire life just casually doing bad things because it's his job. And now he's at the end of his life, and he can't stop refu- at doing the bad things and being willing to admit that he's done bad things, even when there's no literally no consequence involved in revealing anything. So it's just, it, I, I, it's it bugs me that some people have really gone on about it. And but I do get it is long. I understand it is very, very, very long. Yeah. I remember when I saw it in the theater, I had I had to take a, I had to take a break just to go get a hot dog, just so I could have just get up and have something in my system that was actually like nutritious. Because I was halfway through the movie and I'm like, I haven't eaten anything but sugar and salt for three hours. Oh gosh. But yeah. Beyond that, I mean, how did it play watching it at home? Because I didn't, I, I didn't do that yet. I thought it was good. Well, I can't really compare it to a theater because I didn't see it in the theater. It was nice that we were able to pause it without having to, you know, and not have to miss anything. But, that, that movie um, seems like ideal for a Thanksgiving release. Yeah, it was interesting because everyone was talking about it every Thanksgiving. Yeah, I mean, was it like, it was they, like everyone was discussing it with their families? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a good movie to kind of watch for like four hours after you've just eaten and you don't want to visit with anyone anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so what what did you what did you say your pick for the Oscars was in in your estimation? I don't know. I don't really, I don't really understand like how you know they picked stuff. So I just, whenever I want a movie to win an Oscar, I'm like, okay, maybe that'll win. So now I'm just like, oh, yeah, maybe 1917 will win. That would be great. Or maybe Once Upon a Time in Hollywood would win. That would be great. And then I'm like, well, I wouldn't mind if the other movies win either. So I don't know. I'll, I don't really have an official pick. I'll give you a hint. There's not much thought involved. Like if- Yeah, I don't know. Like people overthink it or people, or maybe I'm underthinking it. I don't know. The, the trick is you have to just imagine yourself as, like, a 50-year-old man that, that watches nothing but Turner Classic movies. And once you're in that mindset... So 1917 you... is a lock. <laughs> <laughs> it, maybe. I mean, it, it's... It, 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 just about anything has a chance this year because there's a lot of old-fashioned stuff. So... Yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. See. We'll see. But, yeah. I, I I'm kind of... I kind of need to do some other stuff on this end. So do you want to plug your blog real quick and call it a day for now? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, follow me on Twitter. And my blog is how to watch a movie or how to watch a motion picture dot blogspot dot com. Well, there you go. Thank you so much for coming on again. Thank you for having me. Sure thing. Have a good day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.